back in the early 1970s, I think it was 1971, there was a song that doesn't have anything to do with God, but uh, it's called Mr. Big Stuff. Maybe you remember it. Mr. Big Stuff. Who do you think you are? Mr. Big Stuff. And it's unfortunate, but the Christian world is filled with a lot of people who think that they're Mr. or Ms. Big Stuff. And essentially, that gives them in their holier than thou, righteous, more righteous than thou position to look down upon everyone else and especially those people who are struggling here in the world with various different types of sins and problems that we struggle with pronouncing judgment and so I want you to follow along and pay attention as I try and help you understand that we don't have that right there's a lot of folks who think we do and I hope I can show you that the Bible clearly says that we don't now to start out with you're going to have to understand a little bit about God's law God's law consists of such things as commandments and statutes and judgments. Now, many times you recognize the law of God as being the Ten Commandments, but the Bible talks about God's law consisting of His commandments and His judgments and His statutes. And all of those things added up together, some people have counted it out to be somewhere around 613 different thou shalt's or you shouldn't or never do's along with those things that you must and you should's that are in the Bible. So let's take a look. Leviticus 18.5, he says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Now this is obviously a works-oriented statement. If you do everything that God says, and keep all of the commandments, all of the statutes, all of the judgments, without fail, by doing those, you will live. And that doesn't mean just live here in this earth. We're talking about living eternally, having salvation, having eternal life. If you do them, you will live. Now that's an Old Testament verse, but James 2.10 and 11, James writes, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, essentially, James shows us that concerning God's law and concerning people, if you keep it all, then you're okay. If you fail in one point, you enter into a situation where you have become a law breaker. Now, here in the world, it's real easy to understand that there's a big difference between raping somebody murdering somebody and taking the pen from the bank. There's a huge difference between being a child molester and running your taxes off on the office copy machine without paying for the paper. I mean, we can see that without question. But, from God's perspective, is running your taxes off on the copy machine without paying the office for that expense, is that stealing? Yes. If the lady at the bank doesn't say to you, you can keep that pen, and you look at it and you say, ah, 
I need a pen. Is that stealing? I mean, so if maybe you're not a rapist and maybe you're not a murderer, maybe you're not a child molester, but from God's point of view, if you break one, if you offend in, we just read it, one point, you become guilty, guilty of all, in the sense that you become a lawbreaker. You fall into that category where you have not kept it all. Now, Jesus made it even tougher. Look at Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You've heard it was said of them at old times that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Oh my goodness. So now not only are we guilty if we do the slightest thing wrong or fail to do the slightest thing right, but if we think something wrong, we're just as guilty as, as if we had done it. So when you entertain in your mind something, I said to someone this very week, they were talking to me and they said, well, now that I've gotten older, they said, when I look at a woman, I can say, oh, she's an attractive woman. And I'm not looking and saying, oh boy, I would like to... And the, there is a difference between that. But Jesus is saying, when you look at someone and say in your mind, boy, I wish I could, you are just as guilty. When you're in the store and you look at that, that jewelry and you said, oh, you know... I could slip that in my pocket and leave and nobody would ever know, but I won't. I'm going to refrain. Well, thinking that you would steal it is the same as stealing it. Trying to imagine it is the same. Entertaining that in your mind, it doesn't just apply to adultery, it applies to anything. Oh, boy, I wish I could. Any of those things that are not yours. Now. Given that, it puts us in a position where we are all lawbreakers. Sometime, somewhere along the way, no matter how hard you've tried, you have come short and you have failed and you fall into the lawbreaker category. Now, Galatians 3.24 and 25 explains that there was a purpose for this law. It says the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by Him. And after faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So, we don't think of a teacher as being a schoolmaster, but that's what they used to call him. Used to have a nice long pole with a knob on the end, and somebody falls asleep, you reach out and whack them in the head from the aisle have a large ruler, you're doing something wrong, you get your hand whacked. When I was in school, and I mean, I was born in 1952, so it wasn't that many years ago. Back when I was in school, there was a big paddle on the wall with big holes in it. <clears throat> Somebody got in trouble, grab your ankles, and like the baseball player, whack! You didn't want to have that happen. Okay? The schoolmaster is driving you. Now, if you look at something and you have to step back and say, oh my goodness, there is no way I'm going to make it. There's no way, as a schoolmaster, what the law does is prove to us that no matter how hard we try, no matter what we try to do well, we are going to fail. And we all fall into this category because we cannot keep all of this category and therefore we are all guilty which drives us to look for a different way a different opportunity to live eternally after all you know this old saying dip the cup into the ocean the water in the cup that's your life 
look out at the ocean, that's your death. You don't want to just have that little cup. You want to have the ocean. And you want to find a way to have the ocean in a wonderful and blessed position. So now, under those old covenant laws, what are some of those laws? Now I just said, you know, you know the commandments, but here they are. Have no other gods before me. Most of you don't fall into that category, though you know some people who think their car or their job or there's something that maybe they think is more important than God, but have no other gods before me. You shall not make, that would mean to keep or use, a graven image. Now a lot of you think, I says graven image there, but it says also, or likeness of anything. You know that nice little bird statue you got? How about the angels that you pull out and set around at Christmas time? Maybe you love elephants, or gnomes, or, I mean, there's something maybe that you think is cool. Some kind of animal that's a favorite of yours. All of those little statues and all of those little trinkets and all of that, those are all graven images. Now you may not have thought about it that way, but what does it say? You shall not make a graven image of anything that is in heaven or the earth or below the earth or in the waters. You're not allowed to make an image. Now it used to be people would bow down to those images. They'd make a cow or... You know all those little toys that people, the kids play with? The little farm toys, those little soldier toys? Are those images? I mean, it says you can't do that. Whoops, all going to hell. Because we broke that law. That's just in the Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It used to be when I would walk into a room. I haven't had to do it recently, but I did about a year ago. I walked into a room just as somebody said, Jesus Christ. And I said, no, uh, it's just Jim Blanchard. <laughs> and, you know, it was kind of like, and everybody laughed. But I was making a point. People do it all the time. People take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Did you work yesterday? Did you drive yesterday? Did you walk yesterday? Did you do anything yesterday? Saturday is the Sabbath day. We know it's the seventh day. You can look at the calendar and see that the week starts on Sunday and it ends on Saturday. It's the seventh day. You know that they came to the tomb and discovered the tomb of Jesus empty on the first day of the week, which we have Easter Sunday. That's the first day of the week. So most people don't honor the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. <clears throat> that doesn't happen a lot today. Some children are wise enough to know that. But honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. That would be do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't say they did it or I saw when it's not true. And not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. So, those are the Ten Commandments but amongst all of those other 600 and some commandments, there's a few that I want you to pay attention to. Leviticus 19.19 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. You shall not have a garment that has mingled linen and woolen. Uh-oh. No, uh, no blended suits. You got a linen woolen suit coat? Going to hell. You're lost. Now there actually was a purpose for that because underneath all of these commandments, the priest's garments and things that were in the temple were blended combination things. And so by putting on something that was blended you might be passing yourself off as being a priest, which was not allowed. Although, by the way, Christian, what's the Bible say you are? You are a king and a priest unto God. You're okay. But, in any case, 
What else? Uh, Leviticus 28 and 9. I said, honor your father and mother. Verse 9 there says, he that curses his father and mother should be put to death. <laughs> Ever have a kid say, blank you? Or heard one say, blank you to a parent? Back then, they'd just take them off and kill them. Obedience was very highly in esteem. You know, you would just not have any problem with disobedient children or mouthy children. Uh, Leviticus 18.6 None of you shall approach to anyone that is near of kin to uncover their nakedness. Now, when it talks about uncovering their nakedness, that's one of those terms that refers to some kind of a sexual situation. And there's like 20, sometimes some people maybe even would say as many as 40, but at least 20 different thou shalt nots involving sexual relationships. And in addition to those, people talk about abominations before God. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These things God hates. Seven are an abomination unto him. And it really, abomination just means he, think, he thinks it's disgusting. A proud look. I'm so proud of my son. We wouldn't think anything being, I'm so proud of my daughter. Nobody would think that was wrong. But at the same point in time, earthly pride, God considers to be wrong. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, wicked imaginations, I'm in deep trouble there. <laughs> I'm always, I'll see some criminal get arrested or they'll be talking about it and, and in my mind it would, my mind will say, well, if he'd only done it this way, he wouldn't have gotten caught. Yeah. <laughs> Wicked imaginations. Feet that are quick to run to mischief, bearing false witness, sowing discord amongst the brethren. Oh my goodness. Anybody who's kind of like backbiting and under, undercutting somebody else, sowing discord. Along with then all kinds of things that you are not supposed to eat. And here in Deuteronomy 14, 7 through 8, you shall not eat, I underlined a couple there, hare and swine. I really love rabbit. Now maybe you've never had it, but years ago we raised rabbits, and the only reason I don't raise rabbits now is I got kind of squeamish about killing them and dressing them. And if I was out hunting, it's a little bit different. But to take the rabbits, you know, you have a pen that has a bunch of rabbits in it, and you just grab one out, whack him in the head, and stick him up against the tree, skin him, and cut him, and take him in, and cook him up, and eat him. But that whacking him in the head, I got to the point where that was a little too personal. <laughs> and I, I don't do that anymore. But I love rabbit. Or how about swine? Bacon on everything. I mean, it's the United States of bacon, right? That's what we are. You can't have any bacon. You can't have pork burgers or pork roasts. Or how about those baby back ribs? All going to hell, I'm telling you. You're all going to hell. If you had to follow after the law of God. How about, I like lobster, I like shrimp. You eat squid? Don't eat squid? Okay, verse... Uh, I think that's verse 8 or 9. You shall not eat of the flesh... Okay, and verse 10. Whatsoever hath not fins and scales... You don't see fins and scales on lobster and shrimp. Love those shrimp. Man, those fantail shrimp with the little garlic on it. Mmm, good stuff, okay? You're all getting hungry, you're all going to want to go out to eat as soon as I get done, and I'm, I'm not going to finish early, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, so essentially, what this means is that between those things that you wear wrong, those things that you think wrong, those things that you do wrong, those things that you eat wrong, you have 
absolutely one destination. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. We're all lost. And as a schoolmaster, that causes us then to search for a way out. Now under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, are there any ways out? Is there anything that you can do? Take a look at Ezekiel 18, 19 through 20. Why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? Well, when the Son has done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and done them, he will surely live, regardless of how bad his father was. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. But notice there it said, If you change your ways, if you change and do the things that God has said, then you will live. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked will be upon him. If, verse 21, this is how you got saved in the Old Testament. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and instead keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, then he will surely live and he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Now what does it mean? I've taught you. What does it mean to turn from where you're going and go the other way? That word means it's repent. If the wicked person repent and go in a different direction, then that wicked person will be saved. But now remember, he has to repent of all. In addition to repenting of all, he has to then correctly do all. You can't just repent of the one worst thing that you're doing and have that cover everything. You have to repent of all those errors and do all that which is correct. Now remember, we're in the Old Covenant. That was the remedy. So, what about commandments that continue on into the New Testament? Take a look at Galatians 19, 5, 19 through 21. We aren't going to go through all these things of exactly what they mean. Some of them you'll know and some of them you might wonder. But The works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Under witchcraft, that's a pharmacus, pharmacy, talking about drugs. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness. How about revelings? You like to party? <laughs> going to hell for sure. You know, it's you're going along and you're saying, oh yeah, adultery, fornication, murders, I can see that. Revelings, oh man, I, you mean having a, having a wild party and we're just having a lot of fun, nobody's getting hurt? Revelings. This is New Covenant because it's after Jesus died. This is Galatians. Look at the end of verse 21. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How about Revelation 21.8? Fearful. Are you fearful? Are you afraid to die? Ever been in a position where you thought you might be dying? Were you afraid? Fearful. Unbelieving. Those people who don't believe that Christ died for our sins on the cross and has risen from the dead. Those people who don't believe that there is a God. Abominable murderers. Whoremongers. Probably referring to prostitution. but Whoremongers. Sorcerers. Once again, like witchcraft. Pharmacus. Idolatrous. And all liars. But what about those little white lies? Do I look fat in this? <laughs> oh no, honey, you look really good. <laughs> That's a lie. But you wouldn't want to say, my goodness, that thing makes you look like a pig. <laughs> you would not want to say that unless you want to sleep on the couch for the next month. And so, 
liars. And it says there, all liars. I mean, shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. This is not getting, cost, not getting cast into Sheol or Hades awaiting judgment. This is the second death getting cast into the lake of fire. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 3 through 6. Fornication, which essentially covers every kind of sexual sin that you can think of. And all uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, about foolish talking and jesting. I guess comedi late night comedians are all going to hell. Which may be true anyway, but... Foolishness, foolish talking and jesting. No unclean person, covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Verse 6, let no man deceive you. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. And then we have an additional commandment in 1 John. This is his, that's Jesus' commandment that we should believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. So in addition to all of these commandments, all of these statutes, everything else, there's that additional commandment that we need to believe God, that we need to believe Christ died for us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then, therefore, we would be saved. Now, the remedy for all of those sins in the New Covenant is what we call the Gospel. That Gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, received in His body the punishment for those sins, and by faith in Him we have forgiveness. He died, was put into the tomb, He came out of the tomb, resurrected from the dead, went to heaven, with his own blood, presented it to his Father in heaven, made the payment to buy us back from sin and death, bought the whole field to get the treasure that you are, that he considers all those who believe. That truth of the gospel is the basic remedy for every failure that we have. Romans, 8, Romans 5, 8 and 9 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were justified by His blood, saved from wrath because of what He did. 1 Peter 2.24, He bare our sins in His own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin could live to righteousness. Colossians 1.14, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins by believing on Him. Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.9, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should judge. So the gospel of Christ, the way under the new covenant for us to have all of those ways that we have failed be wiped out so that we can be made just as though we had never sinned, that we can be justified, never sinned. Faith in Jesus Christ. When we believe on Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And remarkably, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, He changes us into new creatures, and He starts us down a path in which those things that are displeasing to God get eliminated from our lives. And he starts, I find, with those things that are most offensive. He starts with those things that are most visible. The Holy Spirit works on us, starting with those things that do damage to our witness, that do damage to the church. And so, all of those things that make us look bad as Christians, that's what the Holy Spirit's work on to start with. That's why I objected years ago because I saw an evangelist who was preaching and anytime somebody would come up on the platform to have him pray for them for some kind of sickness, the first thing he would say is, you smoke cigarettes? You smoke cigarettes, you can't get healed. 
got to take those cigarettes. I mean, he doesn't know if the guy's a child molester, if he's an adulterer, if he's a murderer. It was all about, do you smoke cigarettes? See, that what we see on the outside of people might not even be the worst thing that's going on. But God's working on them on the inside of them through His Spirit. As a Christian, when you believe you receive salvation, then the Spirit starts changing all of those things that you do wrong in the sight of God and helps you to put them behind you according to His timetable, not your timetable. So then we end up at this position, what do we do about judging other people? I was preaching at Fountain Park one year and there was a lady out listening and she said, you mean you're saying we can't judge others? That God doesn't want us to judge others? And I said, that's correct. She got up and left. She'd come every year for years. She never showed back up. Somebody in her church had taught her that it's our right to judge others. That we're supposed to judge others. When in reality, let's see what this says. Now, don't think that I don't know and that God doesn't know that you can see when other people are doing something wrong. You can see it. In fact, you can see that a lot easier than when you look in the mirror and see what you're doing wrong. Because it's a much easier task to look at somebody else and go, Oh my goodness, their life is so messed up. Pot calling the kettle black. Right? So I understand that you can see and understand that other people are sinning. Judging means pointing to them, speaking to them, pointing out their sin as though you are, or declaring to someone else as though they are and you're not. You, you can understand the idea of what judgment means. You're passing judgment on them. Alright. John 7. 23 and 24. Jesus is speaking about someone who was judging him. He said, If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me that I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So Jesus had somebody come to him. He laid hands on them. Jesus healed this man. And it was the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees went nuts. It's against the law to do any work on the Sabbath day. You touched him. You healed him. You performed work. Jesus, you're a sinner. And Jesus said, but didn't you just circumcise that guy? Oh, well, that's the law of Moses. Well, Moses says he has to be circumcised the eighth day. Baby was born. The eighth day was Saturday, and we have to be obedient to the law of Moses. Jesus says, no difference. I just made a guy whole on the Sabbath day, and you circumcise somebody on the Sabbath day. I mean, there are things that we do, and Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath anyway. He could do whatever he wanted to on the Sabbath day. But Jesus pointed that out. But then he said those words... Judge righteous judgment. We are supposed to judge righteous judgment. So, what kind of judgment can be righteous judgment? Are you righteous? Probably not. And he's talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, Judge righteous judgment. Were they righteous? Probably not. No opportunity to even do that. Jesus could do it, but they couldn't. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 3. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before, an un before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we will judge angels? Now, 
here's a spot where you are allowed to judge. If you have two Christians come to you and they ask you to help settle a dispute, and this is what this is talking about, they're saying, what's wrong with you Christians? You two people in the church, you're upset with each other, you're arguing over something, now you're going to sue each other and go to court before somebody who's not a Christian and have them decide? You know, go to somebody in the church and have them talk to both of you and come up with a solution. You can make a judgment without going before the unjust unbelievers and having them make a judgment. So there's an example of potentially righteous judgment. It has to do with settling disputes. Somebody to judge between the brethren. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5. He that judgeth me is the Lord. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Well, we just, we just read that we are going to judge the world. We are going to judge angels. Those people who believe that Christ died on the cross and has risen from the dead are going to reign with Him to do righteous judgment. And we're just told to judge nothing before the time. And what time did it say there? When the Lord returns. What happens when Jesus returns? You get the mind of Christ. You get a new body. You're resurrected from the dead. You become like Him. You will serve with Him. You will judge angels. You will judge the world. You will stand with Him. But you're not supposed to judge anybody or anything before the time when Jesus returns. I don't see how that verse could be in any way misconstrued. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Matthew 7, 1 through 6 is the verse everybody quotes. Judge not that you be not judged. Verse 3 begins that section about having a log in your own eye. How can you see the splinter that's in your brother's eye? You've got a giant beam in your own. Get the beam out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly to help your brother get the beam out of his. How, uh, how long do you think it'll be before you get the beam out of your own eye? When the time comes, right? And Jesus comes. <laughs> then you'll get the beam out of your own eye because he'll have taken it out. Okay. Now verse 6 is interesting down there in that section. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine. You might not like this, but here, swine, he's talking about people. Have you ever gotten delivered from something? Whatever it is. Maybe you used to do this and now you don't. And what's the first thing you want to do? You want to run around and tell everybody else that used to do, that is doing what you used to do, that they need to stop that. You lose weight, so you run around and tell everybody else they need to lose weight. You quit smoking, you run around and tell everybody else they need to quit smoking. You can't fix them. Who can fix them? God can fix them. You can point them to faith in Christ help them understand that God loved them enough to send Jesus to die for them, and if they would ask Him to come into their life and forgive their sins, He would give them new life. But you take a pearl to you, and you toss it out in front of people who are swine, the unconverted people are not going to accept anything from you. The only thing that they can have come to their heart is when the Spirit of God works with you telling them about Jesus, and they get saved. Because what happens when you clean the pig up and take it to the fair? The moment that it gets a chance, it's going to go back into the mud. Because it's a pig. And the, that's the way it is with people. You can get people to stop doing something that's wrong. The moment they get a chance, they'll return. They have to change on the inside, not on the outside. And you badgering them and judging them does not help 
anything. John 16, 7 through 11. The Comforter will come, verse 8, when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin. Whose job is it to point out people's sins? It's the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. It's not your job. When you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed and the voice from heaven comes and He hands you and, and it says, You are now the Holy Spirit. And there's a knock at the door and the angel of the Lord hands you your Holy Spirit ID card. You can put it in your pocket. You can go around. Then you can go around and just point your finger at everybody that you want. Until that happens, you are not the comforter. It's his job. And he will point that out to them. 1 Peter 4, 4 through 5. They think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess riot. You will have to give an account, verse 5, to the one that's ready to judge. Don't worry about the sins of these other people. Recognize the fact that you're going to have to stand before Christ and give an account of the things that you've done. That's scary. Okay? Now, verse 7. I mean, number 7 here. Romans 14.4 Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are judging another man's servant? <clears throat> now a child, while he's still a child, is a servant. When they are no longer children, they are no longer your servants. Your children, you treat them like they are servants. You are in charge of them. It's your job to judge them. It's your job to point them in the right direction. When they grow up and they're adults, it's no longer your job. You can help them, and especially if they come to you for help. But if you continue to judge them when they grow up, they're going to move far away and not listen to you. Okay? Judging another man's servant. I know I've wanted to. I've stood in the line and seen a little kid sitting in the grocery cart, reaching over, pulling stuff off the shelf, throwing it on the floor. That was my kid at that age. Bam, bam, bam. And I'm wanting to... But if I walked up and smacked somebody else's kid, would that be my right? They're not my servant. How many people do you have that are servants of yours? Not many. If you have a few children who are still servants of yours, you have no right to judge another man's servant. You are not granted that. Galatians 4.1.2 says a child's still a servant. James 4.11 talks about even speaking of somebody in an evil manner as being judgment. Romans 14.10 Why do you judge your brother when everybody is going to stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ? Romans 2, 1 through 3 says it even more intensely. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. It's inexcusable. As a Christian, it is inexcusable for us to judge other people. And then at the end there in verse 3, do you think that you're judging them and you're doing the same things, that you're going to escape the judgment of God? It boils down to the fact that we look around and we're saying, my sins lesser than your sins. Your sins greater than mine. I don't know if you remember the cattle ration song, my dog's bigger than your dog. No. Your sin's bigger than my sin. Your sin's bigger than... That's what we're doing. And it's, God says it's inexcusable because we are doing what? The same thing. No, I might not be doing what you're doing, but I am a lawbreaker. Therefore, I'm doing the same thing. I'm breaking God's law. I'm breaking the law. You're breaking the law. And it's inexcusable for me to point a finger at you. Does that make all of these sins that people are committing right? Nope. 
there's still sins, there's still evil, there's all of these things that everybody's doing wrong and I'm doing wrong. It's not excusable. It's not like we're supposed to accept the fact, oh, he's a murderer, but, you know, I'm not supposed to judge. That's right, you don't get to pass judgment. But you also don't get to look down your nose at him. Because at the same point in time, you're just as guilty because you're a lawbreaker. Who do you think you are? And to close, for our salvation, God used a psalmist to write, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. He's pointing to Jesus. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant will stand fast. His seed will I make to endure forever. His throne as the days of heaven. All pointing towards Jesus. If his children forsake my law and not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, I will visit their transgression with the rod. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take away. Praise God for that. Because who are you? Your children, your brothers and sisters, you're in Christ. You are His children. And even when we fail, because of our placement into Christ, we have salvation. And of course, who is He speaking of here in the Psalms? At the end of that, verse 35, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie. I will not lie unto David. And next week, we'll talk about David. Amen? All right. If you've never prayed and asked Jesus to come into your life and forgive your sins, you can do it right where you sit. In fact, I'll lead you in a prayer right now. You can just pray these words along with me, and, and if, you, if you believe in your heart what you're saying with your mouth, God will grant unto you forgiveness, and he will give you eternal life. So right where you sit, won't you just pray this prayer with me? Just say in your heart and mind and speak it forth right from your mouth, right where you are. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I know he died on the cross for me. I believe he came back from the dead. I pray you'd come into my life. Forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I give my life to you. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, you just started a new life. The Spirit of God comes to live inside of you. And each and every day from now on, you will be a little bit more like Christ. Be sure to fellowship with other Christians, interact with other people who believe on Jesus, find a good place to go to church and, and learn more about God's Word. Uh, it's a good idea to get baptized. It's a good idea to participate in the table of the Lord. It's, it's a good idea to have Bible study and, and to read God's Word and pray regularly. But you've just started down the path that will lead you eventually to a joyful, eternity and bliss and an opportunity to be with the Lord forever and ever. And uh, that's a wonderful thing.